Devo, good morning. Thank you for coming. We're here to discuss evidence-based best practice man management of atrial fibrillation. Great. Well, I'm glad to be here. Could you give us your views on why management of atrial fibrillation is so critical? Sure. I think one of the things that I always try and emphasize whenever I'm discussing this issue is don't just think of atrial fibrillation as being a rate or rhythm problem. And although those are serious, especially if they're really extreme, like super high rates or super low rates, but the real biggest risk is the risk of stroke that goes with it. And often people forget that. So I'm always saying first think of the stroke risk, then think about the rate and rhythm issues. Okay. In the past presentations, you've emphasized that clinicians must prevent bad things from happening, specifically strokes. What are your recommendations for clinicians to achieve this? Well, there's a lot of things that people can think about. It's human nature to worry about causing something bad, and less so they're worrying about preventing something bad. And in fact, uh, studies have shown that generally, uh, as human beings, we tend to overestimate rare risk and underestimate common risk. And so what we're trying to do is cr uh, correct that balance here. Uh, when Coumadin first looked, it was looked at with respect to stroke prevention, it turned out for probably about every 10 strokes we prevented, we caused one bleed. And with the new anticoagulants that are out, we're actually making those numbers even better. We're preventing more strokes, and yet we're not causing more bleeds often. We're preventing more bleeds. And the thing about stroke in, in atrial fibrillation is it's devastating. When you think about the clot burden, it's probably as big as the tip of your finger, like one distal phalanx. And so that's a lot of clot that can cause a lot of damage to the brain. And that's why these strokes tend to be either about one-third die one-third are disabled, and it gives you about a one in three chance you'll get through a stroke relatively unscathed. Whereas the bleeds, we can usually get people through quite easily. That's not to minimize how serious those are, but if people are worried about the bleeds, remember, we can get most of those through okay. The strokes, the damage is generally done, and remember that the balance is that there's many more strokes to prevent than there are bleeds that we will cause. Mm, okay. It appears that often clinicians are hesitant to start anticoagulation therapy. Could you review the CHADS2 to tool and the HASBLED tool? Sure. So the thing that we always want people to remember is not everybody with atrial fibrillation needs to automatically be on anticoagulation. We want to identify those people who are really at risk for stroke, higher enough to justify it. So the CHADS2 score is a great system that's been around now for about a decade. So most physicians are pretty comfortable with it. The letters meaning congestive heart failure, hypertension, age, diabetes, and previous stroke or systemic embolus. Over the years, it's gone through a few different incarnations, and in fact, the latest 2014 version is to think first, is the person 65 or over? If so, anticoagulation is recommended. If they're under 65, then they go through the CHADS, and if none of those are met, then they actually ask, what about if they have vascular disease, then it would be aspirin, and if they don't have any of those, we wouldn't recommend anything. So the CHADS2 score is a really useful way to identify who should be anticoagulated versus who can be left alone or just with aspirin. Now people are always worried about the bleeding risk and understandably we do have to take that into account. So the HASBLED score has been developed for that too. The difference is the HASBLED score was designed specifically for patients on anticoagulation with Coumadin, which is why one of the letters, the L, refers to labile INRs while on treatment. So it's not a perfect application to the modern era where we're using other options. But it is helpful to at least look at what reasons people might say, this person's at a higher risk of bleed. Now, the two most important things about HASBLED is don't think that it's specifically a reason to keep people off anticoagulation. It might be a reason to reduce the risk of anticoagulation, or like reduce the dose. Um, and also, there are things that maybe they can target, like uh, uncontrolled hypertension. Well, maybe then they can treat that better or maybe they're on drugs that would increase the risk of bleeding like an anti-inflammatory. Well, maybe we can get those off those. So in other words, we can maybe mitigate the risk, but a lot of the, the components of HASBLED are also the same components in CHADS, like age and stroke and hypertension. So as a result, it's really not permission to say, I'm not going to anticoagulate. There'll always be some exceptions where we just feel the risk is too high, but most times we're just trying to incorporate that into our decision making maybe modify the dose, maybe try and reduce the risks for the patients, but still, generally, we want people to be anticoagulated. So clinicians need to choose the right medication for each individual patient. You've developed a tool to assist in this decision process. Could you review this tool for our audience? Sure. The thing that's tough is we've had three new products come out that are alternatives to Coumadin, three different trials, 
all with certain different nuances among them. And the guidelines that have come out in Canada really just say all of them are options for you, so you've got that, that choice. And that's great. I mean, I, we like having a lot of options for hypertension. We like having options for lipids. So it's nice to have options for anticoagulation. But the guidelines don't really help people to specify. So I was asked, well, how can we maybe make the choices a little easier? So the first thing we said was, well, if we're most mo motivated to reduce the risk of stroke, what about the ones that show that they were superior to Coumadin in reducing the risk of stroke? So that was sort of our option one to look at. And so we had dabigatran at the dose of 150 BID, and we had apixaban at the dose of 5 BID that both proved superiority. Uh, rivaroxaban had a trend in that direction, but didn't quite achieve that statistical significance. So that's why it's left off the list. If people say, well, OK, I'm happy about the stroke risk, but I'm really worried about the bleeding risk. The has bled has come up high, or their creatinine clearance is a little low. So what about that? What should we think about there? So then we said, well, what about of these trials? Which ones showed that they had a statistically significant reduction in bleeds compared to Coumadin? So we had the dabigatran lower dose, 110 BID, and apixaban, 5 milligrams BID, also achieved that. Uh, one thing that was interesting about that trial is they did have a lower dose, 2.5 BID, but it was a very small percentage. So really, both doses are options there. Now, some people say, yes, but I'm worried about BID dosing. And so although I recognize we've got options to reduce risk of stroke or to reduce risk of bleeds compared to Coumadin, what if I'm just happy to be at the same level of Coumadin, but I don't want the INR monitoring, and I want to make sure that compliance is going to be ish an issue? Then uh, the one advantage that rivaroxaban has over the other two is it's just a once-a-day medication in its trial. So uh, the tool was designed to, it's, it's not hard and fast, it's not in stone, but it's guidelines that help people to separate out the two, because the problem is the formal Canadian guidelines don't separate. They just say, you've got them all as an option. They're all favored over Coumadin, but they don't favor any one over any other. And so these are some of the th considerations that can be taken into account. OK. So some pla patients, though, will be more complex. You're developing a program to assist with this group. Could you give us some background on your plans? Sure. So part of the program is already in place. The patients who come through the emergency department with AFib and have some complicated issues to their management, they can be referred right from eMERGE to the urgent cardiology clinic. And they're generally seen within days as outpatients by cardiologists down in the hospital in our clinic in cardiorespiratory. So that's been in place for a number of months and so far it's been working very well. And as we add new cardiologists, that's going to grow. Um, for patients who don't come through the emergency department route but who come through family doctor's offices, we are waiting for our new building to open, uh, expected in the spring, and then all the cardiologists will be there, will be part of PACE, the group in New Market, so we'll be PACE Barry, and there will be a way to fast track patients for those where we'll be able to triage them and make sure they're seen in a timely manner as well, not waiting months to be seen, but ideally still days to weeks to be seen. So that should be ready within a matter of six months or so. Okay. So is there anything else you'd like primary care clinicians to know or remember about atrial fibrillation management? Sure, I think the salient points that we've already addressed are important to remember. Number one, think stroke risk anytime you see patients with AFib. Calculate whether they deserve to be anticoagulated. Number two, remember that these patients should have a new anticoagulant preferred over Coumadin. That's clearly in our guidelines based on the evidence. And uh, number three, keep in mind that we have a lot of resources that are available for patients to have access if they're situations are a little more complicated through the emergency department in urgent cardiology and ultimately through the cardiology group as an outpatient. But for any time that any physician has questions about it, there is a helpful resource through Thrombosis Canada. They have a website available. They also have apps that people can download into their smartphones that can very easily help address some of these questions too in, in these nuanced cases. So I think that's something that uh, is important for physicians to remember. Okay. So just one other question is, um, so first visit you think patients should be on anticoagulation, don't like consider their rate or anything? It's, well, well no, I'm saying think those two, rate. right, but, but always the stroke risk. Now, here's, that's an interesting question because um, we have really four classifications of AFib. There's that first episode, and then there's the paroxysmal comes and goes, then there's the persistent, where they're sort of stuck in it without us doing something to help get them back, and then there's the permanent where they are just in it, and maybe that's because we've accepted that AFib is okay for them with rate control. So that first person, first episode ever, we don't have any good evidence that says we need to anticoagulate, we need to put them on rate or rhythm pills. If somebody came into the emergency department, we could theoretically just cardiovert them and send them home and see when the next episode happens. But I will say, if somebody pops into your office for their annual checkup and they're in AFib, 
Well, that's a different story because they didn't know and so you can't rely on symptoms to tell them. Um, but we do see people who come into the hospital, say, when they've had surgery, like cardiac surgery, or they've had a pneumonia, a chest infection, and that seems to trigger an episode. We don't typically put them on permanent treatment for it. But if you've got somebody who first visit, but AFib, you think is, this is an issue, yeah, if they qualify based on CHAS2 scoring, we would recommend anticoagulation. Thanks very much for coming. That was very, very helpful. Thanks, Paige. That's great. Okay.